Welcome to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, alongside my co-host, Matt Miller. Every business day, we bring you interviews from CEOs, market pros, and Bloomberg experts, along with essential market-moving news. Find the Bloomberg Markets Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast. Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We are streaming on YouTube. Go check it out there. Search Bloomberg Global News and you'll get the feed there. Nancy Curtin joins us. She is a partner, global CIO, and head of investment advisory at Alti Global, based in London, but joining us live here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Nancy, thanks so much for joining us here. I'm just going to put, I'm going to ask you guys for your big picture perspective because 2022 you couldn't hide anywhere equities got crushed bonds you got crushed this year better particularly if you're in some big cap uh tech names how are you guys at alti global looking at the market right now Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me. Delighted to be here. Um, first of all, we entered 2023 thinking it would be a better year for risk assets. Uh, you know, back-to-back -back declines in stocks and bonds. Quite unusual. It's only happened about 2% <laughs> of the time in 100 years. And also sentiment was incredibly bearish. But where are we now? Because now the market has risen. We've remained invested throughout the year. Actually, we've increased risk exposure slightly. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, look, trees don't grow in to the skies. So the first comment is, you know, don't expect markets to be in a linear trend upward from here. Uh, and we've seen some wobbles already this morning. That is healthy uh, a consolidation for markets. But what do we think? We think, look, the Fed will be successful uh, in bringing inflation down. Uh, we already see some encouraging signs, headline inflation, 3%, remember, it was 9% uh, a year ago. Yep. So that's encouraging. There's some sticky bits uh, in core inflation, but we do think the Fed will be successful and bringing inflation down uh, and looking forward to 2024, which is what we'll start to do a couple of weeks away. September, we'll start to look forward to next year. Uh, we think the outlook for a Fed pause, if not pivot, uh, is, is, is encouraging uh, for risk assets. But because of a recession, right? I mean, the Fed can't raise rates 550 basis points without pushing us into a recession. You know, uh, let's let's talk about the reality of the data coming in has been incredibly encouraging. Uh, I can't say that there may not be a mild recession, but I'll tell you the soft landing narrative is getting some increased credibility from the economic data. Uh, let's just take a first look at the consumption numbers. Pretty strong. Uh, have you traveled lately? I mean, it's booming. Okay, so uh, you know the consumer still has pent up savings from the pandemic. They are using this uh, uh, to travel and experience. Obviously, goods uh, less so. Um, but actually, we think the interesting thing this year is the U.S. economy has been much less interest rate sensitive. What do I mean by that? 75% of mortgages over 30 years are below 4%. In other words, they locked in lower rates a couple of years ago. Uh, companies, the same things, locked in lower interest rates. Net interest cost as a percentage of profitability has been declining, not rising, declining. Then we have some fiscal spending, uh, $1.5 trillion. These are multi-year programs, but that's additive. <clears throat> uh, and finally, one of our long-term themes is we think that companies will be investing. CapEx is likely to increase, and that will be a support uh, for economic growth looking forward. Um, so yeah, we could have a mild recession, but I have to say the soft landing is getting a lot of validation from the economic numbers. I so like to push back on that, Paul. Go. You don't want to, though, right? Because you're hoping for a soft landing. I'm, I, I'm, in, I'm all in. I just feel landing. like, you know, the, the curve, the three month, 10 year inversion is typically not this wrong. Um, we've got M2 money supply contraction. Did you talk and to Gary Schilling? Is that where you got the M2? I just was hanging out with Gary Schilling on okay. Sunday. But um, the, the, the thing is, I think, you know, the wealthy people might still have savings, but I I feel like the bottom 80% maybe don't have any left, and we could be getting to the edge of a cliff here for them. Well, uh, let's go into the CapEx spend because we haven't had capital expenditures in over a decade. Like companies, why, you know, why do you need to invest when labor costs are like really low and mm. money's free and commodity prices are weak? But we think that companies will be investing. This is one of the surprises, we think, for economic growth ahead. Um, uh, already CapEx in the second quarter GDP number was up 10% in the recent second quarter earnings. Companies in the S&P 
reported a 15% increase in CapEx. Why do I go on about CapEx? Because it expands the productive potential of the economy. It's a surprise on the upside. And by the way, did you see the labor productivity numbers? 3.7%. Let me say 3.7%. That's up from 1.2 in the first quarter. And remember, uh, labor productivity is a subtraction from inflation to get your unit labor costs. Okay, so let's go back to your inverted yield curve and decline in money supply. Sure, these are normally harbingers of recessionary activity, but I would also point to the fact that yield curves have begun to steepen uh, in the last week or so. We think this uh, will be a trend that we'll continue to see. And as I said, we think there are some solid things that will support economic growth that weren't there in the past. Keep a close eye on CapEx, on showing a manufacturing activity, spending on Gen AI, spending on energy efficiency, uh, and taking advantage of the fiscal stimulus. All right, so I've been overweight all the Miracle 7 stocks, so I've just been killing it. Um, can I now you know, change the asset allocation and maybe go smaller, mid-cap, try to take advantage of increased capital spending, increased economic growth? Can I take my profits in those big names? Well... I wouldn't take your profits, okay. right? Because we ride. really, okay. you know, the infrastructure layer of Gen AI is in the early innings here. Uh, I would try to look more broadly beyond the Magnificent Seven, those other companies that will contribute to development of the infrastructure layer. We can't have Gen AI and large language models without an infrastructure layer. So we do need a lot of building there. Uh, but you're right, uh, you know, they're expensive. They've discounted a lot of good news. And so what we've done is we've leaned into the underperformers, uh, particularly mid-cap, less small-cap, mid-cap, more okay. quality-oriented, less leverage, uh, more exposed to what I call this onshoring of manufacturing theme, CapEx, expend, uh, et cetera. So we've leaned into value uh, and mid-cap because they're 40% cheaper than your Magnificent right. Seven, uh, and they trade at multi-decade discounts versus history uh, and large caps as well. So that's one of the things that we've done more recently. Maybe just buy the equal weighted S&P 500. That's no fun. I mean, I gotta throw it if around. If you think the rest, if you think the the rest of the stocks are going to catch up to your magnificent right SPW, seven. right? Just yeah. the equal weighted. Okay. All right. So, what are some? You know, we had the news today. Moody's kind of dumping on the banks again. It seems like kind of old news. How concerned are you at all with the U.S. banking? system or maybe the global banking well, system. Well, I'm sorry. Another... Where was Moody's back exactly, in March? Exactly. I'm sorry. <laughs> yep. I mean, like well, months later, we wake up and say yep. the small and regional banks uh, have a bit of a, well, there's, you know, their funding costs have risen and they've got exposure to commercial real estate, uh, a trillion and a half of that. That remains a risk, right? Uh, but we've known that risk since March that hasn't prevented markets from moving higher. We think this is a multi-year development. In other words, we're not going to crash overnight uh, from commercial real estate, but I I do wonder where these rating agencies were back in March, why we're doing the downgrades now. All right. So that's a, a, a way of saying that you're not overly concerned about the U.S. banking system or maybe the regional banks? Well, it I mean. is. It is. Look, uh, you know, banking is hugely important to economic growth. And so, you know, regional banks or, you know, where you go, small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and we do think lending will be more constrained. We've seen that in the SLU's number, Senior Loan Officer Survey, right. have come down a bit. But we don't think it's enough to slow the economy, certainly into a deep recession, right? right. You know, mild recession, slow down, soft landing. It's all a bit nuanced, but don't forget CapEx spending, uh, which we think will be a that surprise That is a takeaway here. from today. No, no question about it. You're based in London. How are things in London? Because I'm not going because it's too crowded. The flights are well, Okay, well, here. tourism is on fire. Yeah. You go down Regent Street, you can't even move. Uh, but look, London is, I call, a special child category. It's got lots of issues <laughs> uh, from Brexit <laughs> to higher level of inflation to slower growth to increasing interest rates. Ah, God, don't get me started. It also has, uh, you know, a stock market that's very commodity uh, and oil sensitive and bank sensitive. So it's a bit of a special child. Now, in terms of international exposure, we like Europe much more. We're getting exposure to industrial shares, CapEx spend. Luxury still continues to be quite strong. Uh, our positive earnings growth in Europe, despite the fact that economic growth has been pretty muted. Uh, so that's been where we've had exposure. All right, Nancy, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate you coming in uh, live into our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. What's our takeaway today? We have to get Nancy back is my takeaway. My takeaway is we have to get her back, but CapEx. It's all about CapEx. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Nancy's a partner, global CIO, head of investment advisory at Alt-E Global based in London. But again, joining us here in our Bloomberg studios in New York, we appreciate that. 
You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Yes, we are streaming live on YouTube. You can go over and check it out. Just search Bloomberg Global News. Let's talk transportation. Let's talk trucks, all that fun stuff. Lee Klaskow joins us. He's sector head, senior analyst, freight transportation and logistics. That's a big title. It's a lot bigger than when I knew him. Uh, but he's a Bloomberg intelligence. He, he does it all from the ships to the trucks to the, to the railroads and all that stuff in between. UPS, Lee, uh, United Parcel Service, uh, Big Brown, had some disappointing numbers. My question is, are there disappointing numbers and their guidance? Is it a result of their new Teamsters contract, or is it reflecting economy slowing down? Maybe people aren't getting as many boxes as, as they used to. What's driving it? Right. Well, first off, you can call me Ken whenever you want. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they had actually a Born pod- of fire. Lee Clasco, yeah. born of fire. <laughs> They had actually a pretty decent print uh, on the second quarter, but they did guide down. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we expect uh, the, the the increase in cost from that new labor agreement is going to be maybe a dollar in EPS headwind. Uh, that's kind really? of uh, okay. that's how we're thinking about it. Obviously, that's assuming they're not going to be able to mitigate that through um, productivity gains, pricing, uh, and, and that is what they're going to do. Uh, you know, management said that probably in the spring they're going to they're going to probably lay out how they're going to get back to 12 percent margins on their domestic business. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we're, we're relatively bullish about because UPS has shown their ability to really embrace not only technology, but also to go in into verticals or businesses that are a lot more profitable, like healthcare or the small to mid sized shipper. Uh, you know, I, I heard you on surveillance this morning talking about this uh, UPS story as well as the yell, yellow story. Um, and I note, note that they got a, uh, emergency funding last night Did they? at 17%. Nice. Is that not usury? Yes. Is that not a usury level? Yeah, I mean, uh, what I know, I don't cover yellow, but what what I know about the deal is that it's just uh, it's debt. So just to finance them while they're trying to sell everything, uh, the government is supposed to be made whole before uh, they're they're able to get paid on that seventeen percent. So I mean, what do they have? Refinance just it. just selling their trucks and warehouses, right? Well, because well, they're, they're not any customer that was going to use yellow as soon as they heard. Uh, there was going to be a strike was like, let's find another trucker right now. So yeah, they, this is not a restructuring. This yeah, is a liquidation. Yeah. Okay. And their trucks are old. Their trailers are old. If you see them on the road relative to its peers, you'd be like, that's not a great looking truck. Uh, they're, they're very old. Uh, they've had issues with that for a long time. They don't own a lot of the facilities that they operate in. They lease a lot of them. Um, but there are going to be some facilities that they could, they could sell uh, and, and to raise that money to pay back not only the government, uh, but also the, that new round of uh, financing. All right, so we'll wrap that up and put it to the side. In yeah. terms of UPS, yeah. uh, can they not raise prices significantly? Well, they can. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's let's take a step back. They can raise prices, uh, which will mitigate the inflationary pressures that they're facing. The first year of the new labor contract, there's a big step up in cost for them. So it kind of barbells in the first year and the five year in terms of the step up. It's around a 3.3 KGAR in terms of inflationary pressure. And that includes not only the, the wages that they're getting paid, but also the, the benefits. So if you, if you look at it through the whole five years, it's really not that bad. But the first step up is going to be a big headwind. So, you know, we, we think that they can go back to earnings growth in 2024. Matt's wondering what caker is, but we'll get back to that later. I'm I mean, looking at Matt's. I mean, this is just one of those phrases that you throw around, and I think, I it's another thing that I always forget. All but right. it's I'll let Com- compounded annual growth rate. Okay, boom, there you go. Thank Rich, you. I'm going to bring it back up in this next question. Here, I think a lot is, of listeners are like, "Hey, thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. I didn't know what caker was either. <laughs> exactly. Matt's favorite. One of Matt's favorite functions on the Bloomberg Terminal is COMP. Get, comparative returns. So I've put that up for UPS and FedEx. UPS over the last five years has compounded annual growth uh, in the stock price, 11.75%, a little bit better than the S&P. FedEx only 3.4%. Why has UPS been rewarded more in the stock market versus FedEx? Is it a different model? Yeah, it really depends on like like the time frame you're looking at. Like okay. this year, FedEx has been on fire relative to UPS. But I like the comp function because it just defaults to five years, and I think that's a great yeah. time period to yeah. look at. So. And, o- and over that five-year period, you know, UPS started right-sizing their network. 
selling businesses that maybe you didn't make a lot of money, like they're less than truckload business, the same business that Yellow was in. LTL. LTL, less yep. than truckload. And they were a unionized carrier, and they were, they were getting, uh, on a good year, 100 to 200 basis points in margins. It was just a, not a great business. So they sold that. Uh, they're investing heavily in technology. Um, they are automating their facilities. You know, they're, they're reducing the numbers of uh-ohs or mistakes, like if a, the wrong shipment goes on the wrong truck uh, by half. Uh, they're just they're doing really just a great job in, in their their investment cycle, and not not only that, like I said earlier, they're focusing on more profitable businesses. They're focusing on the healthcare businesses and the small to mid sized businesses. They had an, somewhat of an outsider. She was a board member, Carol Tomei. She came in as CEO a couple of years ago. I think it's like two years net by now, uh, and she's really done an excellent job. People were very. Um, you know, uh, kind of not sure if she was the right person, but she's proved uh, all of her critics wrong. Uh, and, and UPS has really been operating on all, all but, cylinders. But now if their costs are going to go up and they have to raise prices, does this give FedEx a chance to take away more share and do better? Well, UPS on their call this morning, they called out that about 1.2 uh, million packages per day were diverted because of the uh, potential for the strike. And they said about a third of that went to FedEx, about a third of that went to the U.S. Postal Service, and another third went to just regional carriers that you and I probably don't know the names of, smaller players. Uh, and, you know, they will probably win back some of that freight. FedEx, some of it might be sticky, but at the end of the day, you know, a shipper will use a particular uh, FedEx or UPS, not just on price, but a lot of it has to do with service. And if they were with UPS before because of service, they're probably going to go back to UPS. Real quick, uh where are we in a supply chain? Are we kind of fixed? Do you think just a global supply chain? If I order something that's always a fixed, yeah. uh, no, because every week it's something new, right? Okay. Like it's whether the, the Canadian West, Court, uh, West Coast ports just got, like, you know, that just ended. So there's always something different. You know, the Panama Canal, there's not enough water for ships. Is that right? Uh, yeah, they, wow. have, they have to operate uh, with less freight on them. Oh, and it makes it a lot more expensive than to send the freight through the Panama Canal. There's a great book I read about the building of the Panama Canal. I forget who wrote it, but it is an awesome book. Uh, it's a great story. It makes me, I want to go to the Panama Canal. When so did you read that? I'm going to guess you read that 20 years ago? ago? No, a couple, couple, couple three yeah. years ago, maybe four well, years ago. Well, there's a drought there. The lake that fills it up is, that's the problem. All right, 10 seconds. Lee Claskell, Transportation Analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence, joins us. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. All right, well, kind of the news today, one of the news drivers this morning has been Moody's downgrading the credit ratings of a, a bunch of the regional, super regional banks. It seems like, where were you when we needed you? But here we are. Chris Whalen joins us, chairman of Whalen Global Advisors. We always love to talk to Chris, particularly about the banks. I mean, Chris, help us out. You're an expert in, in this rating stuff uh, and the banks. Chris, what do you think about Moody's and, and their call here? The, the Moody's action today was very specific. They were looking at certain banks, and they took the decision to downgrade them. What I think, and that's going to come more. We're going to see a lot more of this because they're adjusting their entire ratings complex for banks to the changes we see in the market and to the higher interest rates. So, the, you know, Basel obviously is going to reduce profitability. So there's a lot of negatives that they're adjusting to. But the thing we have to be aware of is that when you see a sovereign downgrade for the United States, and we can no longer ignore S&P as we have for the past decade, right? We have two of them now. So everybody's going to have to use double A plus instead of triple A. And what that means is that the, the big banks, the ones that get uplift because there's an assumption of sovereign support, are going to go down a notch. And, and I think you can assume all the agencies will have to adjust. See, in Japan, they give you two notches for the big banks. In Europe, they give you two notches because there's an assumption that they're going to bail them out. In the U.S., not so much, you know. Uh, uh, May and Why not? Of, After what we just saw, um, you know, right. we, well, we got the, we got essentially the you know, we're, we're tempting fate when we have politicians who think they can borrow money forever and who go around worried about global warming and ESG instead of doing their jobs. Then this is what happens. People in the Biden administration were terribly surprised 
And it just shows you how, how there's a lack of seriousness in Washington on fiscal issues. It's stunning. On both sides, by the way. By the way, I Chris, think, I was you know, uh, I sat down with Gary Schilling to talk about a lot of this stuff on Sunday afternoon. Mm, great. And um, the one the one question or the one um, problem that we don't really see clearly is the possibility of a debt bomb. You know, if we're continually running trillion dollar deficits at zero percent or at two or three percent, it's no big deal. But once you climb to five and a half to six, it starts to get worrisome. So at what yeah. point is it too difficult for the United States to service its growing debt? Well, it's not just the United States. There's a whole raft of sovereign issuers underneath the U.S., including all the agencies. Uh, you have all the states and the cities, which ultimately depend on support from the federal government implicitly, right? So there's a lot going on. And if we do a funding, say, at the beginning of next year, where we're also doing an emergency bailout for a couple of cities that have been downgraded and can't issue bonds anymore at the old spreads, right? So the pricing is going to continue to change, obviously, throughout the whole complex. Pricing is going up for credit. And then some of them are going to be downgraded. I think New York City is going to be downgraded. So we'll be back in the 70s, you know. <laughs> and and I don't think the U.S. is ready for that because we have so much debt at the federal level. But it makes um, sense. I, you know what? I thought I saw Amanda Gordon, who covers like um, hoity-toity parties, right? Uh, big charity <laughs> events out at the Hamptons and stuff. She had a oh, piece good. out um, – covering john paulson who talked about the rising crime that he's witnessing here in new york and talking about how all his friends are moving down to florida then i saw another piece that um new york is going to open a migrant relief center on randall's island for another i think two thousand uh immigrants but we're already supporting fifty seven thousand two hundred. if you have the big uh taxpayers moving to West Palm Beach and we're bringing in, you know, tens of thousands of immigrants, is it going to be a problem for our tax base and for for rising costs? Well, obviously, you know, New York is predicated on having a very strong commercial foundation. They're the ones who pay for everything. All the infrastructure you see in New York City, the metro, everything. You can't do it as a residential community, Matt. You just can't. There's not enough revenue. And if you were to tax the owners of apartments, or you could call them tenants, really, uh, they are in the same boat. You can't possibly tax them enough to pay for everything. So I think you'll see a reduction in services. The progressive mandate that says everybody is owed housing and support as soon as they show up and, you know, say a smile, right, is going to change. Because I think all of these legacy cities in the northern tier are going to have to downsize rather dramatically. It's going to look like Detroit. Because remember, you know, these cities were here for industrial purposes two centuries ago. Why are they here today? What's their economic rationale, right? Texas knows why it's here today. They're here to make money. But I'm not sure you want to live down there. You know what's so funny is a lot of my business friends have moved south to Florida and Texas, but they don't spend the summer there. They're up <laughs> no. There. Exactly. They, I, I, all of my friends who moved to Florida keep track of the days that they're here in New York. They're like, oh, I can't stay for another three days or else I'm going to get taxed well, but here. Listen, there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who work in mortgage finance and real estate and everything else who have moved out of California and New York and have gone to Texas and Florida because of cost. They literally cannot have a person servicing a performing loan in California today. Too expensive. You might be able to do distressed assets, but you certainly can't do bread and butter, you know, servicing because it's just so expensive to create that seat for that employee. Can't do it. So All right. Look, these states have to come up with a reason to exist. I don't care whether it's California, New York, Illinois. They all have to go back to the drawing board and say, why are we here? How do we make money? <laughs> you know, and that's going right. to be a tough conversation in New York, I think. And it's probably got to start in Washington, uh, many would say. Chris Whalen. <laughs> Chris Whalen is the chairman, Whalen Global Advisors. Uh, give us some color here on kind of what we heard from Moody's here with the bank downgrade and uh, Chris suggesting that it's not just the U.S. government, but it will trickle down to, you know, uh, everything underneath the U.S. government, including states and cities. And that's where we might, you know, really see some pain. You're listening to The Team. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. 
Nancy Tangler, CIO at Laffer Tangler Investments, joins us. Um, Nancy, thanks so much for joining us. TGLR is a new ETF. Tell us about it. Oh, gosh, thanks so much. Free advertising. <laughs> um, yeah, we launched uh, TGLR today. It's an actively managed uh, dividend growth strategy. So um, we focus and always have, by the way, since 1984, when I got into the business, we focus on relative yield because management at large cap companies set the dividend policy based on what they think long-term sustainable earnings powers is. So it's a great shortcut. Um, we don't have to uh, you know, worry as much about earnings estimates as we do, are they able to pay the dividend? Are they able to grow the dividend? And then being an industry leader, which are the names that we own with great management teams, that rounds out the portfolio. So it acts differently than um, maybe a more traditional equity income strategy. We don't have utilities in this portfolio. We have one REIT, because we're looking for growth at the end of the day, just like every other investor. So, uh, Nancy, Matt Miller here. Hi, thanks for joining us. Hi, Matt. What, uh, what holdings do you have in the ETF? What are the uh, biggest stocks that you're, that you're uh, allocating? Well, so one of our largest holdings is Broadcom, which, you know, we bought at because of a great capital allocation plan. They reached at one point they were returning almost 100 percent of free cash flow to investors. But in addition, as time has passed, we're going to get VMware in this transaction as well. That should be closing soon. And the AI bump, which uh, has really driven the stock this year. Uh, but dividend growth has been five year annualized about 24 percent. So that's that's one of our largest holdings. We are overweight tech in this portfolio, which you maybe wouldn't normally think about uh, in, an, in a dividend growth strategy. But there actually are a lot of great companies. Oracle would be another one that pay the dividend, um, you know, have a yield about in line with the market, a little bit above. And they're growing at about 12 percent a year. And oh, by the way, they're probably the cheapest uh, uh, AI generative AI cloud computing platform. So that's kind of given the stock a new burst. So we a own AI, new Nancy, a lot of people have been saying AI bubble to me over the past couple of days. Analysts on the street are using that term. Um, do you think this is an AI bubble? I don't. Um, I think a couple of things. First of all, we know we have a very tight labor force. You're not dragging the baby boomers back in that with the net worth of about 75 trillion collectively. So we're going to be living with this with this tight labor market for some time. And if you go back and look historically in other periods of tight labor markets, um, what you'll see is that tech spending as a percent of GDP goes up pretty dramatically, one to 2%. And then in addition to that, uh, you get the earnings flowing through to the company. So technology stocks have always outperformed in period previous periods of labor shortage. This one was is predicted by um, the government to go from 2015, where they think it began, all the way through 2047. So I would use weakness in these stocks to, to add. I mean, the question is, can they monetize? Microsoft has shown us that they intend to monetize a generative AI with their co-pilot offering. So for your for this ETF, what's a I guess what's a, a, a model name to put in there in terms of dividend yield and dividend growth? What do you guys look for in order to put that in, into this portfolio? So we start with the valuation, which is relative yield. And we, what we're looking for is our companies who um, have a, a dividend paying culture. So they, they are committed to the dividend. They sometimes state as McDonald's does that it's a portion of what they think long-term sustainable earnings power is. But but most of these companies, it's implied. So we we own some of the, the usual suspects that you would expect to see in an equity income strategy. So Home Depot would be an example. Uh, we also own, um, we just, have been adding to our positions in Starbucks, we own Walmart, but then we also have this exposure uh, overweight, a pretty big overweight to industrials, and then a modest overweight to technology. So these these companies have long histories of paying the dividend, and uh, it gives us information as well as it contributes pretty materially to total return, especially the dividend growth part. Did you do um, you know channel checks, looking at the appetite for new ETFs? Obviously, last year was a banner year for ETF launches. Um, we've seen them slow down a little bit this year. It's still strong growth, though. Um, what's your view on the ETF, Nancy, as, a, as an investment vehicle? So I just um, just finished my uh, the second edition of my book, The Women's Guide to Successful Investing, and has a whole chapter on ETFs. I think they play a very important role in uh, investors' portfolios. Uh, this particular strategy would serve as a core uh, that you would sort of 
decorate around uh, with more aggressive, uh, higher risk ETFs. Uh, we we launched it because our minimums are pretty high, and we were turning away a lot of people that were interested in working with us. So this is one way we can you know make our uh, strategy accessible to them. And uh, it's been it's been uh, an interesting experience, and the launch went off pretty well today. So we're pretty happy about that. The expense ratio is a little bit steep. 95 basis points. Does that stay there or do you bring it down once you get um, more flows? I think we we bring it down. I mean, I also wrote a whole chapter on um, how fees are the biggest eroder of total return. And so you need to pay attention to that. So we're very committed in our in our wealth practice and then um, with this fund to, to be a reasonable access point for individuals and to add value above and beyond the benchmark, which we've been able to do historically in our separately managed accounts. I thought, Paul, we could ask Nancy about Apple, you know, yes. because it's been it's a bug in your bonnet. It is it's to be in your bonnet. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, Nancy, you look at you <laughs> mentioning your overweight tech. How frustrating is it to see a company as, as great uh, as Apple with the cash flow it has to pay a dividend less than one percent? I know when we when we got into that stock, this is the crazy thing. I don't think anyone remembers this. The yield was at three percent in 2013. Uh, it was above the ten year at hmm. that time, and and they were growing the dividend. So we we actually began accumulating our positions that at that point added to it over the years have basically um, sold the majority of our holdings. But this this particular ETF does have a small allocation. Uh, about two two and a half percent to that particular stock, and I, I think it is important that management continues to grow the dividend, but they could continue to grow it in a lot more aggressive fashion. So I am a little bit frustrated by that. And some of the other great, you know, uh, technology companies, cloud computing like uh, Google and even Amazon, the only way you can generate income off of those is to sell covered calls. So, um, but we're not doing that in this do, particular. Do do buybacks? Do cash buybacks make you feel any better? I mean. Yes, but I mean it's it's more sentiment in my view, um, just just like splitting a stock. But yeah, like ServiceNow just announced um, they they are engaging in their first share buyback. Um, you know that's going to put a floor under the stock at some point. But um, so we look at that. It's important to us, but it's not our overriding concern uh, when we're when we're looking for new names. Yeah, looking at Apple, uh, the indicated yield zero point five percent. That's the bad news. I guess the good news is they've. Five-year net growth, 7.26%. So they are growing it, but again, a lot of folks like myself think we could see, we should see a, you know, two, two and a half, three percent dividend yield on that name. But that's not how they view their use of cash. Nancy Tangler, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Nancy is the CIO of Laffer Tangler Investments, uh, and their new ETF uh, out today, looking at um, dividends and dividend growth. TGLR is the ticker. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Nancy Tangler, CIO at Laffer Tangler Investments, joins us. Um, Nancy, thanks so much for joining us. TGLR is a new ETF. Tell us about it. Oh, gosh, thanks so much. Free advertising. <laughs> um, yeah, we launched uh, TGLR today. It's an actively managed uh, dividend growth strategy. So um, we focus and always have, by the way, since 1984, when I got into the business, we focus on relative yield because management at large cap companies set the dividend policy based on what they think long-term sustainable earnings powers is. So it's a great shortcut. Um, we don't have to uh, you know, worry as much about earnings estimates as we do, are they able to pay the dividend? Are they able to grow the dividend? And then being an industry leader, which are the names that we own with great management teams, that rounds out the portfolio. So it acts differently than um, maybe a more traditional equity income strategy. We don't have utilities in this portfolio. We have one REIT, because we're looking for growth at the end of the day, just like every other investor. So, uh, Nancy, Matt Miller here. Hi, thanks for joining us. Hi, Matt. What, uh, what holdings do you have in the ETF? What are the uh, biggest stocks that you're, that you're uh, allocating? Well, so one of our largest holdings is Broadcom, which you know we bought at because of a great capital allocation plan. They reached at one point they were returning almost 100% of free cash flow to investors. But in addition, as time has passed, we're going to get VMware in this transaction as well. That should be closing soon. 
and the AI bump, which uh, has really driven the stock this year. Uh, but dividend growth has been five-year annualized, about 24%. So that's that's one of our largest holdings. We are overweight tech in this portfolio, which you maybe wouldn't normally think about uh, in, an, in a dividend growth strategy, but there actually are a lot of great companies. Oracle would be another one that pay the dividend, um, you know, have a yield about in line with the market, a little bit above, and they're growing at about 12% a year. And oh, by the way, they're probably the cheapest uh, uh, AI generative AI cloud computing platform. So that's kind of given the stock a new burst. So we a own AI, some Nancy, a lot of people have been saying AI bubble to me over the past couple of days. Analysts on the street are using that term. Um, do you think this is an AI bubble? I don't. Um, I think a couple of things. First of all, we know we have a very tight labor force. You're not dragging the baby boomers back in that, with the net worth of about 75 trillion collectively. So we're going to be living with this with this tight labor market for some time. And if you go back and look historically in other periods of tight labor markets, um, what you'll see is that tech spending as a percent of GDP goes up pretty dramatically, one to 2%. And then in addition to that, uh, you get the earnings flowing through to the company. So technology stocks have always outperformed in period previous periods of labor shortage. This one was is predicted by um, the government to go from 2015, where they think it began, all the way through 2047. So I would use weakness in these stocks to, to add. I mean, the question is, can they monetize? Microsoft has shown us that they intend to monetize a generative AI with their co-pilot offering. So for your for this ETF, what's a I guess what's a, a, a model name to put in there in terms of dividend yield and dividend growth? What do you guys look for in order to put that in, into this portfolio? So we start with the valuation, which is relative yield. And we, what we're looking for is our companies who um, have a, a dividend paying culture. So they, they are committed to the dividend. They sometimes state as McDonald's does that it's a portion of what they think long-term sustainable earnings power is. But but most of these companies, it's implied. So we we own some of the, the usual suspects that you would expect to see in an equity income strategy. So Home Depot would be an example. Uh, we also own, um, we just, have been adding to our positions in Starbucks, we own Walmart, but then we also have this exposure uh, overweight, a pretty big overweight to industrials, and then a modest overweight to technology. So these, these companies have long histories of paying the dividend, and uh, it gives us information as well as it contributes pretty materially to total return, especially the dividend growth part. Did you do um, you know channel checks, looking at the appetite for new ETFs? Obviously last year was a banner year for ETF launches. Um, we've seen them slow down a little bit this year. It's still strong growth though. Um, what's your view on the ETF, Nancy, as, a, as an investment vehicle? So I just um, just finished my uh, the second edition of my book, The Women's Guide to Successful Investing, and has a whole chapter on ETFs. I think they play a very important role in uh, investors' portfolios. Uh, this particular strategy would serve as a core uh, that you would sort of decorate around uh, with more aggressive, uh, higher risk ETFs. Uh, we we launched it because our minimums are pretty high and we were turning away a lot of people that were interested in working with us. So this is one way we can you know make our uh, strategy accessible to them. And uh, it's been it's been uh, an interesting experience and the launch went off pretty well today. So we're pretty happy about that. The expense ratio is a little bit steep, 95 basis points. Does that stay there or do you bring it down once you get um, more flows? I think we we bring it down. I mean, I also wrote a whole chapter on um, how fees are the biggest eroder of total return. And so you need to pay attention to that. So we're very committed in our in our wealth practice and then um, with this fund to, to be a reasonable access point for individuals and to add value above and beyond the benchmark, which we've been able to do historically in our separately managed accounts. I thought, Paul, we could ask Nancy about Apple. You know, yes, because it's been it's a bug in your bonnet. It is it's a bee in your bonnet. <laughs> exactly. Right? So, Nancy, you look at you <laughs> mentioning your overweight tech. How frustrating is it to see a company as, as great uh, as Apple with the cash flow it has to pay a dividend less than one percent? I know when we when we got into that stock, this is the crazy thing. I don't think anyone remembers this. The yield was at three percent in 2013. Uh, it was above the 10 year at hmm. that time. 
and, and they were growing the dividend. So we, we actually began accumulating our positions that at that point, added to it over the years, have basically um, sold the majority of our holdings. But this this particular ETF does have a small allocation, uh, about two, two and a half percent to that particular stock. And I, I think it is important that management continues to grow the dividend, but they could continue to grow it in a lot more aggressive fashion. So I am a little bit frustrated by that. And some of the other great you know, uh, technology companies, cloud computing like uh, Google and even Amazon, the only way you can generate income off of those is to sell covered calls. So, um, but we're not doing that in this do, particular Do ETF. buybacks, do cash buybacks make you feel any better? I mean, yes, but I mean, it's it's more sentiment in my view. Um, just just like splitting a stock but yeah like service now just announced um they they are engaging in their first share buyback um you know that's going to put a floor under the stock at some point but um so we look at that it's important to us but it's not our overriding concern uh when we're when we're looking for new names yeah looking at apple uh the indicated yield 0.5 percent uh that's the bad news i guess the good news is they've Five-year net growth, 7.26%. So they are growing it, but again, a lot of folks like myself think we could see, we should see a, you know, two, two and a half, three percent dividend yield on that name. But that's not how they view their use of cash. Nancy Tangler, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Nancy is the CIO of Laffer Tangler Investments, uh, and their new ETF uh, out today, looking at um, dividends and dividend growth. TGLR is the ticker. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Matt Miller, Paul Sweeney here in a Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We're streaming live on YouTube, so just head over to that web thing and search Bloomberg Global News, and you'll, take, you'll find our video feed there. Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, two big pharma companies, all-time highs today. Look at those charts. They're just absolutely monster charts, particularly uh, in the last 20 years. So we're going to figure out what's going on there. Something about an obesity drug here and, and reducing heart attacks. All good news, all big news. But we need to get uh, talk to somebody who is actually an expert in this stuff. Michael Shaw, Senior Industry Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, he's based in London. Mikey, thanks so much for joining us here. Could you tell us... What is going on with the Novo Nordisk uh, and by de and also by extension, Eli Lilly? Um, what's going on today? Yeah, so Novo basically had a, um, a landmark trial readout. Um, so it looked at Wagovi and cardiovascular outcomes. Now, the base case for this was a 17% risk reduction um, on cardiovascular outcomes. And really, um, with the result, we saw like a home run result. So it actually reported a 20% benefit. And what's more is that all, um, all drivers of the composite endpoint, so um, heart failure, um, stroke, uh, and cardiovascular death, um, they all drove that benefit. So really a home run result for, for Novo there. Mikey, the, uh, the main question people ask me and that I also uh, want to know the answer to about these drugs is what could the long-term effects be? You know, if you're shooting yourself in the leg with these every week for the next you know 10 years what what happens to your body well i think it's clear that we've seen you know we've seen substantial weight loss associated with these products um so novo wagovi's got about well showed up to 18 percent um tizepatide showed more than 20 percent in terms of the side effects well i mean initially you know it, it, G the GLP-1 class in general is associated with GI side effects, so gastrointestinal side effects, things like nausea, vomiting, um, et cetera. Um, you know, this is a class of drug that's, that's been used for years um, in, in diabetes. Um, and, you know, there have, have been kind of anecdotal reports of things like suicidal ideation that we've seen in the, in, in the news recently. Hang on, what, what, um, say, say what? Su say, what is it? Suicide? Suicidal ideation, yes. Oh boy, um, but like you got to also remember, you know, you know these um, these patients are you know obesity, and there could be actually other other things contributing to that. So nothing's been seen in you know nothing was seen in the clinical trials and the large clinical trials. Um, so you know I think 
the safety of these drugs is, is kind of well documented. Um, and, and, you know, there's been a lot of experience already with, with diabetes. All right. So just to sort out what's on the market here and who owns it. Um, the so ones Mike, Mike and his team did a big report on just this whole place, this obesity stuff. I mean, I'm ex I think this could be a game changer for yep. the Western world. Uh, you know, obviously, if there are no long term side effects, I don't want to be giving birth to a three eyed fish later. But uh, so Novo Nordisk does Wegovy and Ozempic, right? Those are both from Novo Nordisk. And yep. then Lily has um, Tirzepatide as well as ret ret uh, retatrutide. Um, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so uh, Novo, Mago well, basically, Wagovi and Ozempic are both the same molecules. Just Wagovi is a higher dose that's marketed uh, or approved in obesity. Ozempic is um, approved in diabetes. Um, Tazepatide is marketed under the brand name Monjari for diabetes, and it should get approved in, um, you know, towards the end of the year for obesity. And then retitrutide is a compound that they've got in their um, in their in their pipeline, which has yeah, which is you know showing potentially better data than tazepatide on on weight loss. So that's something coming through the pipeline. At the All moment. right, but the, anytime I talk to you, Mikey or Sam, it always comes down Sam Fazelli, your partner in crime. It always comes down to who pays for this stuff. So who pays for this stuff in the big markets around the country? Do I, I, I have to saw. Write a check? I saw by the way that the University of Texas. Um, has taken these drugs off of its insured covered coverage list because the University of Texas system was paying five million dollars a month for its employees to get hold of these things. So yeah, so I mean that's a key question at the moment, given the size of the well, the potential size of this indication. Um, you know, historically, what we've seen with these drugs is obesity. You know, it's been kind of more of a lifestyle choice. It's been an out-of-pocket market. Um, but we haven't seen the weight loss data that's, that's you know, associated with, the, with these drugs historically. Um, so now with this outcomes data in hand, that's really going to drive broad reimbursement. Um, and it's, I think it's going to be tough for payers to kind of not cover these drugs if, you know, if we're going to be showing a 20% reduction um, in kind of cardio cardiovascular risk. And recall that heart failure is kind of one of the leading causes of death in the US. Um, and also it has, you know, costs associated with it, which are kind of a significant burden on the healthcare system. So, you know, the long, long, long term savings, you know, that these drugs could potentially offer, you know, are, are going to be huge. So it's kind of. You of course, know, you could achieve the same hit. savings or certainly similar savings if people would just eat less ice cream and go to the gym more often. Right. <laughs> so that's the. That's that, the problem that, that's true too. <laughs> that the insurance uh, that the companies uh, paying for the insurance probably have. Like my employees either make horrible choices and take this drug and then I pay five million dollars a month or my employees make good choices and I don't pay anything and no one needs to take drugs. Yeah, no, that's true. true. That's true, too. All right, Mikey. Uh, all right, that's the obesity side. We, I, I got my plays there. I, I know how to do that. Another big area that we'd love to see some breakthroughs and maybe your companies will do it is just kind of dementia broadly defined as the world's population ages it becomes a bigger and bigger problem for a lot more people. What's, what's your industry? What's the pharma, what's a biopharma in uh, industry? What are they doing there? I mean, we've seen, um, I mean, it's not my area of, uh, area of focus, but we've, we've obviously seen um, Lakembi from Biogen and Esai um, come through, and then we've got Lily with uh, Denanumab. So, you know, these are treatments for Alzheimer's. Um, Lumbeck as well has got, um, has shown kind of positive data for Alzheimer's agitation. So that's like a supplemental um, indication for one of their drugs, Rexalti. Uh, um, so, you know, these are, you know, this is an area where, you know, the success rate has, has not always been high and, and you know, uh, drugs associated with the, or being developed in these areas are kind of highly risk adjusted. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I guess it remains to be seen. It's not an area that I focus on um, in particular. Um, so I leave my colleague, you know, Sam Fazelli to look at that. Ah, oh, please. Um, but there's certainly kind of um, developments in the, in the pipeline. All right, so what's next for, uh, you know, the Eli Lilly's of the world, the, uh, the, the Novos? Uh, I mean, these stocks all time highs. What do you think they do? Are they continue to go out and and buy what they can't develop? It seems like every Monday we come in and there's a big pharma M and A trade. And does anybody else make one of these uh, appetite suppressant shots? Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, 
Um, I mean, we've seen kind of a rally in Amgen, we've seen a rally in Viking. Both of them have GLP-1 um, drugs in their pipeline. Um, other companies include Zealand, ah. Altimune, um, and, and Pfizer's uh, also got like an oral GLP-1 as well. Um, so there are several de uh, companies developing these um, GLP-1 drugs for, for obesity. Uh, in terms of what's next in the space, um, so I think we're going to constantly see this back and forth between Lilly and Novo um, on, the, um, on the innovation front. So we've, uh, Lilly, uh, Novo's got Wagovi, Lilly's going to bring in Tezepatide. Novo's then got Cagri Sema, uh, which is a combination product. Uh, and then we've also recently seen you know, really strong data for Retitrutide, uh, which is a triple agonist, unlike uh, Tezepatide, which is a dual agonist. So it's targeting three, um, three things instead of two. All basically. right, so Mikey, it's really important for you and for healthcare investors to follow where different drugs are in the regulatory pipeline. You guys actually have a model of that, don't you? Um, yeah, we have a um, tracker. We have a model on the system. Yeah, we have a tracker on the system, and it's the best. It's the best on Wall Street by far. <laughs> Who's the person that There's manages that again? Who's the person? Oh yeah, so Sam and I look at it. Uh, uh, manage all right. it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's the best on the street. They track every single. How drug. do I get to it? B I is, what? What do I, I type? Know. We'll find it. I'll get it for you in a second. But it's it's just the best. If you're a healthcare geek, you have to have this thing because you have to know where drugs are, when the tests are coming all that kind of stuff, and the Bloomberg Intelligence guys do that. Mikey Shaw, Senior Industry Analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, appreciate getting some time there. Uh, Eli Lilly, Novo, both all-time highs here today. You're listening to The Tape. Catch our live program, Bloomberg Markets, weekdays at 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Ryan Lockwood joins us. He's the CFO of CarParts.com. Trades on the NASDAQ. PRTS is a symbol. Company went public back in 2007. They did a secondary offering very adroitly uh, in 2020 when their stock got a nice pop from the pandemic. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for joining us here. Uh, again, look, I'm looking at your long-term chart, and it just looks like a lot of other pandemic charts where you had this surge in 2020 as people – behaviors changed during the pandemic and then it's been kind of a slow bleed off after we get post pandemic here. Talk to us how your business kind of changed during that, you know, 2020 period pre pre that period during the pandemic and kind of where we are now. Yeah. So our, our business, thanks for having me. Our business did change a little bit, but actually a lot of the change came from a new management team that came in in 2019. So part of what we did was revitalize the business and focus it more on the customer. Um, you know, we obviously benefited from some of the stimulus and some of the online shopping that came from e-commerce, but combined with that, we changed to a more stock ship model that it provides more value to the customer. We improved the website. So there's a lot of things going on as part of the story. What, what are the drivers of your business? Uh, like when I look at your financial model, what are the key drivers that I need to get right? I think the key drivers for our business, what you're going to see over the next three to five years is a combination of uh, reasonable revenue growth with com with combined with operating leverage. So there's a lot of things we can do to improve marketing expense, fulfillment expense, fixed operating leverage. And we've done a lot of improvements over time. They've all been relatively sticky and we continue to drive improvements over the next, you know, three to five years. All right. So what, give me a sense of kind of who your customer is uh, and kind of how do they really interact with carparts.com? Yeah, so our customer is going to be generally a value-oriented do-it-yourselfer who is relatively sophisticated or looking to do some easy jobs and save some money. Compared to brick-and-mortar stores, we're 50 to 60% cheaper. So if someone's willing to wait one or two days to get their part online, they can have um, significant value, uh, and that's especially uh, useful in a time like this. All right, so how do I, you know, in your business, how do you drive top line demands is it just having more stuff more SKUs that they may need or is it marketing promotion how do you drive drive your top line you know for us driving top line uh, you know there's a lot of value that we provide high quality parts but what we're really looking to do is take the stress out of car repair if you have a car that's out of warranty that check engine light comes on there's not really a great resource for people and that's what we try to do is provide information high quality parts uh, great value pricing. And if you can't put it on yourself, we'll even connect you to a local mechanic. 
So we're really trying to provide a one-stop shop for customers uh, that takes the stress out of car repair. So how, you know, it seems like what we understand here in the post-pandemic world that Detroit says it's going to build fewer cars. So the days of 17 and a half million SAR might be over. Maybe it's 15, 15 and a half million cars. That means cars got to, I guess, last longer, use cars, all that kind of stuff. Is that good for your business? Definitely. I think that's that's right. When you look at SAR, you know, we had obviously a very lower SAR, um, you know, kind of coming into this year and, and part of last year due to interest rates. SAR might come down, but cars definitely have been lasting longer. They're going to continue to last longer. And I think consumers are going to try to drive value by repairing their car, having it uh, last longer. And I think we're a great resource for them. Talk to us about, I'm not sure if this is part of your business model, but we've seen it in other retail uh, spaces. Buy now, pay later. Is that something you guys offer? Is that a driver? How do you think about that? Yeah, that is a driver. So over the last couple of years, we've seen uh, buy now, pay later actually triple. It was running um, pretty steady around 2.5% of revenue for e-commerce. And recently it popped up uh, at the end of Q2, it was running 7.9%. So we have seen a large uptake in that. I think it's a way that consumers are trying to balance the needs, uh, their everyday needs with their car repair needs. You know, it's funny, you go to the Consumer Electronics Show and it's really <clears throat> an auto show, you know, with a little bit of technology around it. I mean, I think the auto industry, you know, controls way more than half the space there out there in Vegas. How has like the computerization, the, the increase in technology in automobiles, how, do you, how has that impacted your business? There, there actually hasn't been that much of an impact. You know, what we sell is a lot of the normal everyday items you need to repair your car. So even with a highly electrified vehicle or even an e EV like a Tesla, they still have headlights, taillights, door handles, uh, AC compressors, radiators, all the normal nuts and bolts, as you might call it, that go into a car. Even the most modern of all cars still has those basics. Okay, so you're not getting into the electronics and, and that type of stuff. That's something that, you know, an owner would have to go to the dealer or something like that. That's correct. Yeah. And I think those are usually very durable. So the ECU, as you might call it, inside of a car that, that manages the brains of everything is very robust. The things that go out for people are the everyday items like the AC yep. compressor, the window regulator that makes the window go up and down. So is your competition kind of just my local car dealer in town? Our local competition is going to be really the brick and mortar, the big brick and mortars you might think about, or maybe a dealership where... Uh, I think people that don't know about us might just walk in and pay $300 for a headlight without realizing that they could come to our website, wait one or two days. You know, we cover 98% of the country in two day shipping. They could buy that same part for $135. So it's interesting. I'm just kind of wondering again, kind of the, the grow of the business. It seems like, um, I don't, do you, can you acquire customers? Can you market and say, Hey, you can do this. Like I'm not a handy person. I'm not a, but if you say, Hey, you can install this headlight. That's exactly right. So we recently just launched a line of YouTube instructional videos, uh, starting with the Ford F-150. It's the nation's sure. most popular car, uh, showing you how to replace a lot of parts on that. Cool. We're going to the Dodge Ram. And we also recently launched a Spanish language version of this channel uh, to kind of hit more audiences and make people feel comfortable that they can do these repairs themselves. That makes sense. All right, Ryan, thanks for taking the time. Appreciate uh, learning a little bit about your company and kind of uh, its expectations and kind of how the one of the drivers of this company, Ryan Lockwood, he's the CFO, carparts.com. Uh, you can check out the stock. It is trades on the NASDAQ, P-R-T-S. Thanks for listening to the Bloomberg Markets Podcast. You can subscribe and listen to interviews at Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you prefer. I'm Matt Miller. I'm on Twitter at MattMiller1973. And I'm Paul Sweeney. I'm on Twitter at P.T. Sweeney. Before the podcast, you can always catch us worldwide at Bloomberg Radio.